Phew. <laughs> well, that is a ridiculous start to this. I think I ended up putting up three different videos and, and then when you click go live, it says it's not there. So anyway, sorry to you guys who've been sent from pillar to post. I think Tim is also kind of wondering what is going on. But uh, we are going to be looking at this article. And I must say I really like the illustrations here. Um, it's an article by um, Kathleen Kale, right? It's from Vanity Fair, and it's titled Gabby Petito's Life With and Death by Brian Laundry. I particularly like this sort of subtitle, um, Forensically Examining Instagram Accounts, Interviews, and Police Reports, author Kathleen Hale, right? reconstructs their relationship and she really does a great job she really does do a great job and also in, in terms of the reconstruction also reconstructs the incident at the spade creek camp right so that's really what we're gonna be looking at and i would love to read the entire article it's that good but uh, that would be cheating and stealing from the author so what I'm going to do instead is highlight a couple of things. And um, you guys should really read the article. I give it 10 out of 10. The, um, the ending is particularly poignant. And a lot of the articles, a long form article, will take you a while to get through. But uh, a lot of the content is certainly the way that I would write. It's anchored in everything that we know. It's anchored in the Moab incident. It's anchored in media reports. It's anchored in things that people close to these individuals have said, and some that I think we've even forgotten about, right? Um, I think the author, Kathleen Hale, provides 20, is it 25 references. Some of those references were, surprisingly for me, quite new to me. Um, although I knew that Gabby had a, a, Pinterest, a Pinterest account, I didn't really... I don't think I've actually seen this particular page before. Um, so I, kn I knew that she had Pinterest, but have you seen some of these um, things before? Um, but anyway, we're going to go into that. I think one of them was words, which I, th which I found quite interesting. Where's word? Is word somewhere here? I think it's this one. And this one in particular kind of stood out to me. But, um, and then another one like that one. And uh, where's that other one with a building? That one as well. So anyway, I'm going to go through the article, but I'm only really going to concentrate on the dynamics. And let me guys ask you guys a question. Do we already know the central relationship dynamics between Brian and Gabby? What do you guys say? Do we already know the essential relationship dynamics between Brian and Gabby? Karen G says, um, my, my news app requires a subscription for this article. Okay, well, I'm, uh, I am able I am able to read it. I'm not sure if it's because I'm a subscriber. Um, have any of you been able to read the article? Um, any of you been able to sort of go through it? Stephanie says we're going to go over it a lot of a lot of, a lot of it here now. It reads like um, a narrative about what happened to Gabby and Brian. So. That is what we're going to do. So shall we get started? As you guys can see, I'm getting a little bit more au fait with the technology. Um, so yeah, so let's keep going. What do you think of the design? It's quite, quite well done, isn't it? It's quite a well done design, I thought. And of course, the other illustrations as well. Um, where is... Yeah, anyway, the other illustrations as well, but I'll get to those in a moment. Um, okay, so without any further ado, let's get going. So 
trust an author to do an exceptional job anchoring the van life narrative and that's what it is it's a narrative it's a story it's a story that actually started one day from now the 2nd of july gabby and brian embarked on this journey and they actually kind of embarked on it prematurely they intended to to leave a little bit later than what they ended up leaving so it seems like they were um, getting itchy feet they were in a hurry maybe they were in a bit of a rush maybe one of them is, was in more of a rush than the other uh, maybe they weren't ready when they left but trust an author to do an exceptional job anchoring the van life narrative in facts interviews evidence and then going a little further providing some intuition providing a bit of a poetic flourish to um, you know knitting all of these facts together stitching it together stitching together the media narrative in a way that it flows and it's fluid and it really does resonate um, you know, telling it in her own words, although using a lot of the original words um, of other people. For, exam for example, a colleague of Brian's, a guy called Michael, that you may remember, said a few things about him and Gabby. It's one of the few anecdotes we've got about um, Gabby and Brian, right? So um, let me just bring myself, make myself the center of this. Um, we get one of the few, um, uh, how can I put it, uh, kind of anecdotes of the, the um, people at the center of this, Gabby and Brian, where, you, where their dynamic is, is um, recorded by a third party in a way that reflects on both to some extent, both Gabby and Brian. What I mean is, in the Moab incident, you never really see Brian and Gabby interacting with one another. There's a short little moment right in the beginning where um, they are sort of, how can I put it? They are um, in the car together at the really the very beginning of the Moab incident, but then after that, um, they are separated. So you don't really get to see them interacting. And so there is this very rare anecdote from Michael who talks about something that he sees Brian doing to Gabby. And this is something the, this author also highlights. So I think let's get started with that. Okay, so um, the illustrations in the article also do something to recast the narrative as we remember it. Um, but it also discolors it slightly. So there's a picture of Gabby. It's part of the title image for this video. Um, there's a picture of Gabby, and it's sort of like a watercolor. And she's standing in front of the sea. And it sort of doesn't look like Gabby, but you sort of know that it is her. There's also a picture of two people holding hands, surrounded by, by trees. You know that's Brian and Gabby, but it sort of doesn't, it doesn't look like them, but it sort of does. And you sort of get the feeling of reality shifting. And that's what, what makes the illustration here so well. I think it's a South Korean illustrator, Hok Young Kim. Good job. So um, it's kind of a reminder that reality can shift and does shift over time as memories weaken and shift in the gyre of the present. So Hale, Kathleen Hale, opens up her narrative by reminding us just how naive and big-headed Brian could be when he was with Gabby. Brian was a less is more type, and his idea of strutting his stuff was to never wear shoes and trying to get Gabby to do the same. Brian really thought he was a big deal because he could walk around without shoes, and he was kind of had this idea that one day he would never wear shoes again and he would never buy shoes again. And this was going to make him into some kind of original and special character. Um, and then um, you cut to Brian in his final hours at the Mayakachi Creek, the environmental park. It's the same park that Brian's dad actually visited earlier today, this morning. And suddenly Brian's not so good at living with less, let alone wanting to be alive at all. Kathleen Hale does a great job st stitching the social media narrative together, but more particularly, and this is the part I want to focus on. I would love to go through the whole thing. I would love to deal with everything. 
but um, she does a great job intuiting the relationship dynamic and how it was unraveling. And that's a particularly difficult thing. It means you've got to do a heck of a lot of research. It means you've got to pay attention to everything you can find that has been said. And let's face it, not a lot. We don't know that much about Brian Laundry. We don't, you know, we haven't even, we haven't even seen an interview with either of his parents. And sometimes you get a sense of the son through the father or the son through the mother. And the only sense I think we do get from them in the sense that they haven't spoken to the media is that they, you, one gets a feeling that they're somewhat contrarian, right? Um, so over and over again, we see instances, this is from the author of this Vanity Fair article, anchored in evidence, um, as I say, 25 references are provided at the end of the article. In other words, she's kind of trying to remind you that she's not sucking this out of her thumb. This narrative is actually anchored in reality. So really the kind of thing I like to do, which is why I'm so excited about it, that I've, that I've um, jumped onto um, this article to share with you guys, something I would have loved to have done, um, but my book writing days are temporarily over. I don't know if there's enough material for a book on the Petito case um, in the sense that we, because we still don't know that much about Brian. And prior to this letter as well, um, the Brian side was was quite thin, right? And um, and in that sense, in in lieu of there not being a book, this long form article really does the job. It really is a long narrative, but it's not too long. It's not fluffy. It's got all the right amount of um, detail. It's really crisp and clear, and it really gives you the sense of bias um, in favor of Gabby and against Brian, which I think is done quite well, because it's, I think it's quite easy just to see them both and, and realize, well, at the end, something goes wrong, but I'm not quite sure why. Um, Kathleen Hale sort of loads it with a bit of bias and does a really good job with that. Now, I've seen someone did leave a comment saying they didn't like the way Kathleen left something out of the Moab incident where, where um, there was a witness who said um, Gabby slapped Brian. But from the narrative perspective, she's trying to thread the needle all the way to the end. And um, in such a short narrative, you could, you could possibly confuse the reader in terms of that. Um, you're trying to write a tight narrative. I do understand the person commenting saying that that's not strictly speaking accurate that's a sort of a nuance, a subtlety where Gabby did something. Um, but I don't really want to talk about the this author's treatment of the um, Moab incident because I'm going to be dealing with that separately. Um, so, so I'm going to quote here and there from the article. Um, uh, she does, as I say, sketch Gabby as a beautiful um, person constantly earning social kudos in different situations, while Brian is like the ugly duckling of the pair who feels increasingly spare. Um, she uh, conjures, but out of the actual narrative, a couple of times, a couple of instances where exactly this happens. And um, it really makes it come alive, really makes the story come alive. So this is a quote from the article, and this is just an, uh, to give you a sense of her writing prowess and what she's so, sort of doing and how she achieves it. Kathleen writes in Vanity Fair, quote, while Brian stood at the edge of the crowd, likely waiting for someone to ask him how he'd hiked all that way barefoot, Gabby launched into a well-received presentation to everyone below about how awesome her shoes were. Later, REI, I think that's a shoe company, would reach out to her directly, saying they hoped the rest of her hike had gone well. And then that is um, anchored in a, in a reference, right? That's anchored in a reference. And that happens to be reference number two. Just quickly have a look at reference number two here. As I said, the 25 right at the end. 
And number two is that's from Gabby's own Instagram, right? So that's where that comes from. Okay. And so she's really done a forensic examination of that. And she's talking about a real incident where Gabby um, uh, spoke to a group of people. And as, as um, is recorded here, or is recorded on Gabby's Instagram, it was well received. Um, then, um, so all of these people liked what Gabby had to say, and it was about footwear, as far as I understand it. But then Brian was walking around barefoot, probably with his feet burning and not really enjoying it very much. And so there's a good example of where Gabby is this pretty girl, what she says everybody likes, and she gets some um, reinforcement from this, from REI. And then Brian is sort of this, this funny clown on the side, um, kind of being awkward. She, she goes on to write, Brian was not as supportive. Lately, he'd been trying to convince Gabby that she couldn't make a website by herself. Sometimes he made her feel like she couldn't do anything right. But now, all at once, she seemed to be on the right path. Maybe Brian didn't know everything. So as you can see, she's really um, living in their shoes and, and making a couple of inferences, but they're all based on the actual narrative. Where Kathleen writes, Sometimes he didn't make her feel like she, sometimes he made her feel like she couldn't do anything right. There's a reference to that as well. Um, and uh, so it's not just this author um, assuming. It's not just her opinion. Of course, when she writes, maybe Brian didn't know everything. That is her opinion, but it's sort of uh, something that, um, it's a conclusion that makes sense. Does that make sense? Um, Kathleen Hale contrasts not only Gabby's beauty repeatedly, but Brian's ugliness. And so if Gabby was beautiful inside and out, it seems Brian was ugly inside and out. And here's an example. I just think it's done so well. And again, while it reads effortlessly and it reads with fl um, fluidity in a fluid way, and it reads so well, um, you can, I can just into it, I can just imagine how long it took for the author to get all of this information. Um, she didn't just have it at the top of it. She had to go and study uh, these people to get all of these details. So when you read it, it just seems like simple little bits of information, but it, it creates this wonderful picture that's accurate, but it, it was definitely hard won. It would have taken a lot to to get this information. Before I read it, let's just have a look at some of your comments. Um, Janae Ann, sorry to hear about you not feeling very well. Um, Double Rainbow says, yeah, I caught a live. I'm usually a replay player and paying membership to be just my monthly donation. Thanks a lot, Double Rainbow. Um, Rainbows, thanks. I'm glad that you caught this. Thanks a lot, Janae Ann. Appreciate that. <laughs> thanks a lot. Um, Catherine Hargreaves says, it may be that the pending lawsuit will yield previously unknown information about Brian. For sure, for sure. Uh, and I think the best information you're going to get is in the form of text messages. Text messages really show the kind of person you are, the tone that you have, and, and that sort of thing. Anne Trower sent a cute super sticker to show support. Thanks a lot. I can't always see them in the format that I'm on, but I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for letting me know as well, Stephanie. Um, Catherine also says it is an extremely well-written piece. Indeed, it is. Okay, so let's um, deal with another quote. This is a quote just describing Gabby. And just listen to how um, poetically it is put together. And um, with great intuition and a great balance of um, the facts. Gabby Petito was a Pisces, an astrological sign known for being bad with boundaries, excessively romantic, 
and unable to remember at times whether something had actually happened or if she'd simply dreamed it. She loved sunflowers, butterflies, the color aqua blue, the Beatles song, Let It Be, and mar marijuana. And there's also a reference there which narrowed her turquoise eyes into shimmering green slivers and made her hungry for M&Ms. A little boy for whom Gabby babysat later described her as someone just living with rainbows. She did things to beat, she did things to the beat of her own drum. His mom agreed, and there's also a reference to that. She was beautiful, in other words, inside and out, which is another way of saying that she was kind to ugly people. I just love the way she's so effortless with the dark side to this. Um, she she um, tells her story, but in a very effortless way, she reminds us of the sort of dark side, this undercurrent to everything we're talking about. When she talks about her being kind to ugly people, what is what sort of bell does that ring on in your minds? Now, uh, let's have a look at what you guys are saying. Um, Celtic Meltdown says the first six presidents were Pisces. <laughs> um, yeah, so Choice says the description of her death was like in slow motion and it made it difficult to read. It, that is done very well. And that's something I'm not going to read here. That's something the author spent a lot of time um, imagining and putting together. I'm not going to refer to that, but I'm going to refer to a the very last footnote or the, the very last reference. Um, then um, HI says, you know, astrology depends on, on this or that or the next thing. Um, but she's just talking in a in a general way, but a way that I think is intuitive and accurate. Julie says, it's always surprising somehow to remember that Brian was a big child who lost 40 pounds. That's also a really great point. Good to see you, Julie. Okay, so, so this is where we get a sense of that really, really valuable. It's I don't know whether it's the only one, but it's a very, very rare, valuable um, anecdote from someone who actually saw Brian and Gabby together and was brave enough to talk about it. Um, and th there's another person who did as well, Rose, who we know quite well, but there's somebody else that I think you either don't know about or you've forgotten about. And that's um, a fellow called Michael. He never gave his surname, but he's a coworker. And um, that's the other aspect which which um, Julie has just brought up is the f did you guys know that Brian used to be forty pounds overweight? He was forty pounds overweight at school, and so what what is the, being the fat kid? Uh, what is that aspect when you're at school? How does that impact um, someone in their formative years? What is the, the response to that. So, I mean, to his credit, Brian did lose the weight and he did seem to gain the confidence to meet Gabby and, and say something to her. But um, one wonders, one's got to wonder, um, was his confidence not um, sort of artificial to begin with? What, what Was his confidence um, a kind of false bravado, right? So anyway, this is the text from Vanity Fair from Kathleen Hale writing about Michael. And yeah, she's actually gone into the media narrative and gotten this particular quote. So the, these are actual words from a, a former co-worker of uh, Brian's who saw the two of them together. And so these are his words. And this is quoting from the article. I thought he was a weirdo. He never came across as the kind of person that would be the killing type, but he did have that tendency to be, I don't want to say the wrong thing and make him sound worse than he really is, worse than he already is, but he was the kind of guy who would get pissed off pretty quick. And that I've um, 
highlighted here in bold. I mean, that is quite a big statement. He was the kind of guy who would get pissed off pretty quick. And how do you think that that plays into the circumstances at Spread Creek Camp, right? Um, someone said something about self-esteem. Zircon says self-esteem took a big hit growing up, absolutely. And then how long does it take to recover from that? Do you ever recover from that, right? It's also interesting that somewhere in her narrative, Kathleen Hale describes Gabby as an extrovert and Brian not necessarily as an introvert, but sort of as a loner. Okay, so going a bit further, um, what kind of guys would you say get pissed off pretty quick? Well, loners often do. Uh, losers feel criticism more than winners do, or those embraced by the rest of society. Um, Hale describes Brian as lecturing his co-worker, lecturing Michael, on the benefits of yoga at a garden center, and he likely did the same to Gabby. So often out of this position of weakness, you have this arrogance, out of this position of uncertainty and inadequacy of this um, impression, this act of bravado, and I think that describes Brian very well. And um, of course, the um, I don't know why this is doing this. I'm trying to show you this particular article. Maybe if I do that, but uh, this is the source for that particular um, reference. It comes from. Michael Ruiz, Fox News, Brian Laundrie's former co-worker remembers him as a chameleon. So that's another aspect to him. And a weirdo who sometimes lost his temper, right? So Brian seems to have in common with Caitlin Armstrong an outward zen while harboring inward res resentments, if you catch my meaning. Hale also describes Gabby as hardworking and inspired. That's another theme that she picks up on. It's easy to see some of the broad strokes that are quite clear in the narrative and then miss some of the more subtler aspects. And one of the more subtler aspects is um, Gabby gets jobs and she works. Brian gets jobs and he works. But if you read between the lines and if you... Um, pay attention, you notice that Gabby seems to do more um, with her time and Brian, not so much. Brian seems to not work for whole blocks of, of time. And um, certainly in Kathleen's, uh, Hale's telling of the story or retelling of the story, Brian comes across as, lazy, as a lazy entitled couch surfer. And so this is also quoting from the article, she writes, Quote, to Gabby and Brian's high school friends, the relationship seemed toxic from the start. So there's another instance where other people have sort of come forward. They don't really identify themselves much. I think there was someone called Anne who may have said something. But um, it's quite odd that her, their high school friends haven't sort of come forward. They sort of remained invisible even like a, a year later with the exception of Rose and, and the sort of anonymous person that's talking now. Um, so uh, they say their relationship seemed toxic from the start and they always had some drama, right? And that also comes from an article that comes from uh, this article from September 22nd, right? Um, friends reflect on romance between Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry, right? Um, and then, yes, a, a person, Ben Matula, who said, there was always something below the surface where things weren't 100% wonderful, right? Okay, so, so again, she's basically providing um, references to everything she's saying. It's not thumbs up. So 
this is the account in the garden center that showed that there, there was some kind of toxic edge to Brian's jealous control over Gabby. So you might say Brian was jealous or Brian seemed jealous, or I think Brian was controlling. Well, what, what did it look or feel like in action? You might say, I think it was there, or I'm sure it was there. Well, what did it look like? And if you're making this lifetime movie, and you might say, it's, it's not time for that. But imagine if you were, someone said, you need to make the movie of this, or you need to write the book about this, or you need to write an article, or you just need to imagine it. Where could you find something out of the real story and base it on something real in order to inform the story that you're telling, right? And so this is it. And this is where Kathleen Hale uh, mentions this particular incident. She says, when Gabby visited Brian at, at the garden center and chatted with Michael, so when she spoke with Brian's co-worker, Brian would come up behind her, behind Gabby, draping one of his conspicuously clean hands over Gabby's shoulder and pull her in for a kiss that left everyone but him feeling awkward, right? Now, once again, there's a little bit of a, a dark edge to that, that whole description. You know, her, her describing Brian's conspicuously clean hands. I don't know about you, but you, you start to notice Brian's hands when you pay enough attention to him. His hands seem to be quite big. Um, you see his hands during the Moab incident. And those are obviously, in the end, uh, murder weapons, right? And so the author is also trying to touch on those little um, red flags in your mind as she's sort of moving along. And just think about how creepy it is, you know, Brian coming up behind her. Although this is a, an innocent scene, it's nevertheless got the, the tinges of the darkness to come. Him draping this hand over her shoulder and then he pulls her and he kisses her in front of the colleague as if to say, she's mine, look, she's mine, kind of thing. And then, um, so again, I just wanna sort of compliment the author by just saying how well she juxtaposes Gabby's light and Gabby's joy and Gabby's sparkling personality and Gabby's likableness with Brian's darkness. She does that really well um, in a way that's authentic and in a way that's believable, in a way that resonates and in a way that's written very, very well. So here's another example of that. She writes, as someone who lit up a room, Gabby inspired envy wherever she went. Her female friends from high school were more like enemies. At best, they wanted to be her. And at worst, they sneered at Gabby, pushing her away when she came to them with problems. And I think what that shows in a way is the kind of subtext to Gabby's social media. I'm sure there was there was a lot of envy um, among friends and people who didn't even know her. I think even her family said we envied Gabby and what Gabby and Brian were doing, right? So I think that was part of the subtext and I think Gabby knew about that. But there was also another side where there was sort of a kind of sneering and resentment. And maybe Gabby is quite sensitive to that. Remember, Gabby was like a, an artist as well, um, a sweet person, a soft-hearted person, but also sensitive. And maybe when someone was joking, she took it personally, and that invariably would perhaps drive her into um, Brian's creepy arms and hands kind of thing. So when she was at school, um, Gabby's relationship with Brian was so close but kind of oppressive at times but at other times it seems so intimate that other people would say why can't I have a relationship like that right and that but they only wondered that when things were going well when the relationship was rocky the the same girls ridiculed saying oh my god just break up and spare yourself from the drama and everyone else from having to hear about it you kind of get the feeling that her friends are quite sort of flaky, right? And in, in any event, this also comes from the media, from the, this is also a media story. Gabby Petito case, friends say couples relationship was toxic at times, 
always had some drama, right? Okay, so Hale describes Brian's love for Gabby as suffocating, and if that word seems apt, that is ultimately how Gabby lost her life, by being suffocated by Brian. So let's have a look at some of your comments here. Um, Ford Criminal says, I love that word, sneering. It does say it very effectively, doesn't it? Julie says, yes, it is dark. Public reminders to others and Gabby um, that she's his, almost public gloating too. And Catherine Hargrave says, he surely thought a lot of his own artistry and... Um, intellectual pretensions. Yeah, I, I must say, when the more you think about it, the more you get the idea that Brian was very pretentious, like kind of an empty vessel, and Gabby was his big trophy, you know, that proved that he was somebody kind of thing. And of course, when Gabby was no longer there, well, the trophy is gone, now what have, who are you kind of thing. Yeah, Yvonne, Phillips is suffocating and suffocated, so sad. So I do want to recommend you guys try and read this article. I think you can read it by subscribing without, I think you there's a special offer or something. I'm not yet to sell Vanity Fair to you, but it definitely is worth looking out for. Um, I think the Van Life Adventure, oh, hang on, there's just another quote here. So there's another quote from Vanity Fair. Brian wanted everyone to know that Gabby belonged to him, but Brian had no way to support his fiance. He hadn't had a real job in months. So that is, um, I think, a big part of this whole mess in a, in a nutshell, is you know Brian wanting everyone to know that Gabby is, is his. It's not just that he's happy being in a relationship with her, but he's got to tell everyone that. And now they're on social media, and it's the strange and unpleasant scenario where there are pictures of him and her, but people are more getting more and more interested in her and less and less interested in him. And so his ability to control that dynamic is sort of diminishing. And also the fact is, as the van life journey progresses, He's got no way really to support his fiance, right? Um, I guess he's got to lean on his parents or something like that. And that's the reality. That's the reality. And I think as that reality dawns on him, a sort of a, a, a raw panic starts to overtake him, that he's losing his grip, he's losing control. And if he's not careful, he's going to lose Gabby. And at the same time, I think Gabby's aware of the same thing, that Brian's losing his grip on her she's already in a way rebuffed his marriage proposal to say not yet we're young and that thinking is now going in a different direction as if to say well maybe i can have a different life to this a bigger life or something like that um there was something else i wanted to say in terms oh i think the other thing that would have concerned gabby is brian's work ethic Yes, she is working on the website, working on the social media, working on the YouTube video, and Brian seems to just not be interested. He wants, the main thing Brian seems to want is, is her to pay attention to him. And that's going to be a bit of a turn off. So, um, is it over here? That's the quote I want to refer to here. Uh, where is it? It's not there. It's okay. Well, anyway, we'll get to that in a moment. I thought I'd highlighted the quote, but I but I haven't. Okay, so I think the um, van life adventure appealed to. 
Brian and Gabby, but for totally different reasons. Brian was totally unrealistic about it. He thought he could hang out with his girl. They were going to sort of go in the van and somehow everything was going to be paid for. And um, they were just going to have fun and they were going to live life on the cheap. But even if you're living life on the cheap, they are they are running costs like fuel um, and food and other things. But somehow I, Brian seemed to not think about that, whereas Gabby seemed to be aware of that. And she was trying to do something about that, but then Brian didn't like that. Brian, uh, sorry, Gabby wanted to make the adventure work, whereas Brian was just wanting to hang out with his girl and in the end, I think, trying to make the relationship work. And I think it would have worked, the relationship would have worked if they both worked harder on making the van life adventure sustainable, if they were a team. Um, increasingly, Brian couldn't understand and later tolerate being with her while she wasn't paying attention to him. This toxic monopoly of Gabby's time and attention started even before their misadventure in the van. And I'm going to quote another um, thing from the article that's got a bearing on this, but I must also say, as someone who is a, a, a creator, someone who's, um, I guess, to some extent on social media, a fair amount, but also um, presenting and, and so on, um, it has definitely caused stress in my relationships, um, uh, to a certain extent because of my commitment to my work, um, yeah, and, and other things as well that I won't go into, but um, uh, it definitely does have an impact, especially if you're trying to make a living out of it. So there's another quote from Vanity Fair. Reality hit hard. They had sunk Gabby's savings into a van that was essentially the same as Gabby's Nissan Sentra, only with a bigger trunk. There would be no kitchenette or toilet. They would need to cook and poop outside. Gabby was happy to invest more in the trip, but when she started working 50 hours a week at Taco Bell, Brian was furious. The idea of her ringing up burritos and jumbo sprites for other men likely irked him. He didn't want Gabby to work. He wanted her to spend all her time with him, right? And so here is where you get some reinforcement for that. Um, this is from Rose Davis. Gabby Petito's best friend says Brian Laundrie had jealousy issues, right? I, don't, I just want to see if there's a picture here of Rose Davis. It doesn't seem to be. Okay. So he didn't want Gabby to work. He wanted her to spend all her time with him. And I think you can extrapolate that. You can apply that to the, the whole van life project in a way, right? And also perhaps the reason why they argued, oh, is Kathleen Hale in chat? Wow, okay. <laughs> Kathleen Hale, um, well, it would be awesome if you could narrate part of your article. I don't know if I can send a link to you so that you could get on. Uh, maybe we could do it maybe another time because I'm, I'm almost at the end. But um, let's see what Kathleen Hale says. Um, Kathleen Hale is here. Okay. So, Kathleen, are you thinking at all of writing a book on this case? Um, <laughs> Let's see if I can uh, see, Kath wow, the chat's moving so quickly, I can't. Sarah Hathaway says, the article sounds as though the writer's actually present during the scenarios, which, oh, okay. Um, Thought Criminal says, I think Gabby was a constant reminder of everything he was insincere about. Um, I'm just trying to see where Kathleen Hale is. Um, has she made a particular comment somewhere? So anyway, my question to you, Kathleen, is 
are you thinking of writing a, a book about this? Um, I mean, what you've already written is um, really good. Is it something you want to expand upon? Bearing in mind there is a fair amount to expand upon now with what's come out and what's going to come out in the future as well. Uh, have you and Kathleen worked together before? No, uh, but it's an interesting question, Stephanie. Um, okay. Anyway, let me continue. I think Kathleen's maybe concerned that I'm going to read her old article and, and, and that's not what I intend to do. Um, okay, so... So um, a question that I had was... Had Gabby and Brian watched Nomadland? You know, had they realized how hard things were about to be? And maybe they had watched it, but they still hadn't realized how hard things were about to be. Um, this is something that I brought up during my analysis and the whole idea of when did they go on the van life journey and when did the movie Nomadland come out? Bear in mind that it won an Oscar the same year. So the easy life wasn't going to be an easy transition when they entered the van life. Okay, so um, I'm pretty much done here, but I, I sort of feel like, I don't know whether Kathleen feels like you've quoted my article enough. Um, is it okay if I mention one more quote? It's from... Um, is Are you okay, Kathleen? I don't know what... Uh, Kathleen Ail says, okay. <laughs> I hope that was in response to what I've just said. Uh, oh, Kathleen Ail says, yes, the article is a, uh, what has happened now to that? Kathleen made a comment that we are a great true crime group, but there was something where she said, uh, there it is. Kathleen says, yes, the article is an excerpt from a book I'm writing. Well, um, it's very obvious to me, Kathleen, as someone who's written quite a few true crime books myself, that that a heck of a lot of effort went into this article. And because it flows so smoothly, um, I mean, I can tell that you're an author, but I can also tell that it is going to work as a much broader narrative as well. And I think people are going to be really interested in it. Um, it's almost unfortunate that your book's not going to come out before the Lifetime movie. Is there, do you have any idea when your book is going to be coming out? Kathleen says, happy to join whenever. So, yeah, maybe we can do a, um, a special thing with you where you can maybe talk about what you want to talk about and beyond the article and things that haven't really come out in the public. So maybe we can do that when it suits you. Pauline Buckle says, excellent article, Kathleen. Do you have a book cover yet, Kathleen? Um, Choi says, let's stop chatting for a moment so Kathleen's text can come through. The new Anne rule, okay. Okay, so Kathleen, I'm going to read. It's me, Kathleen. Happy to join whenever. I love your channel. The article is an excerpt from my book I'm writing. Quote away. So Kathleen, uh, can you tell us what your book is going to be called? The title of your book. Um, can you tell us that much? Can you tell us when it's coming out? Stephanie says, um, Kathleen Hale is interested in the emotional character side, and so I can relate to that. Thanks a lot for that, Sarah Hathaway. Okay, so I'm going to quote another thing from your article. It's uh, where you say, meanwhile, this quoting from Vanity Fair, 
Meanwhile, Brian stewed, luring Gabby away from Long Island into a house where she would not need to pay rent, had likely ensured in his mind that he would finally have Gabby to himself with no outside obligations, like family, friends, or work to divide her attention. Later, a longtime criminal profiler would say he suspected that Brian's entire self-worth was rooted in the relationship with Gabby and that without her, he's got nothing. So I must say, when I read that, I was wondering, mm, I wonder who you're talking about there. So now that you're here, I suppose we can ask you, um, do, you do you mind sharing who you were referring to when you talked about this long-time criminal profile? I've got an idea. I think it was someone from, from the FBI, but probably someone on maybe News Nation or something. Um, but do you want to expand on that? Who said that? Yeah, I actually saw that. I think that's that's mentioned in the in the Vanity Fair article. Okay, okay. So I actually want to read that again with the idea of just emphasizing this whole thing of Gabby's this hard worker. Tell me, what do you want to do? Do you want to? I think Timmy feels neglected while I've been focusing on this. Um, while Gabby's been this sort of hard worker, Brian is sort of seething and, and stewing, and he's at home. And I, I love the way uh, Kathleen sort of talks about luring her into this sort of web where she doesn't really need to do anything. But the problem is when they go from there onto the van life thing, well, then what about work? Who's going to be doing the work? And so, unfortunately, I think Brian's laziness extends, you know, into the van life thing. And Gabby's work ethic extends into the van life thing. And that's where they, I think they have a clash. He wants to just be with her. She wants to make the adventure work. And she's more realistic. He's more idealistic and more naive, I think. So it's this idea of Gabby being lured by Brian into a situation where he, he won't need to pay rent, but who do you think is actually paying the rent? Who do you think is actually in charge of that situation where uh, Brian will be, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not his home, right? So in other words, he's kind of riding the coattails of somebody else. So there you get a sense of Brian as this manipulative character, right? Um, per Bug says, I will look for your book in August. Um, yeah, it is a nice surprise, Yvonne. It definitely is a nice surprise. Um, Kathleen says, I'm going out to publishers with the Gabby book now, but I have a different true crime book coming out this August called Slender Man still working uh, on the Gabby title, but thinking, living the dream. Yeah. Well, I must say, you've got a really clever title in this Vanity Fair article. Um, Gabby, Gabby Petita's Life with and Death by Brian Laundrie. I was just wondering if you could shorten that, but... Um, yeah, it's it's difficult to to come up with a with it, you know. Okay, so Lisa says, okay. Lisa B says didn't see the article. Well, I'll I'll put a link to the article. There it is. Uh, Living says Life with Brian. Who remembers that movie, the movie from the 70s? Life, isn't it Life of Brian? Thanks a lot, Sarah Hathaway. Okay, so, so um, let me read that one more time. Um, so it's this whole context of the transition from 
the home life to the van life. And I think Kathleen does a really good job showing how the home life is like lazy from Brian's perspective and kind of dysfunctional <laughs> and possessive and all that. And so doesn't that just translate directly into the van life? Gabby's um, working hard, she's working these 50 hour weeks, doesn't that translate into the van life? So, and so when they're together, does Brian just expect it to be a holiday, right? So let me read this again, um, it's from the article. Meanwhile, Brian stewed, luring Gabby away from Long Island into a house where she would not need to pay rent, had likely ensured in his mind that he would finally have Gabby to himself with no outside obligations like friends, family, friends, or work to divide her attention. And I think exactly that um, thing, that, that sort of dynamic, I think that exactly that psychology was how Brian was thinking about the whole van life thing, was where they wouldn't need to pay rent, but also in his mind, he'd finally have Gabby to himself. No outside obligations, no family, not even her family sort of uh, calling him Brianna or whatever it is, and um, friends getting in the way. He would kind of have total control over her, only to go out into the, the, these situations and then have the sort of nightmare of, well, social media distracting her attention, work distracting her attention, logistics distracting her attention, um, money uh, taking her kind of out of their relationship and, you know, like to her family and whatever. And so, and now he's got, kind of got to juggle a totally different set of balls kind of thing. Anyway, um, did um, Kathleen answer the question about the longtime criminal profile who said, that he suspected that Brian's entire self-worth was rooted in his relationship with Gabby and that without her, he's got nothing. <clears throat> it's a Monty Python movie. I think it's called The Life of Brian or something like that. Um, yeah, Julie makes a good point here saying Vanity Fair did a groundbreaking John Monet article back in the 90s. Yeah, that was also by um, Anne Bardach, I think. Yeah, that was also very well done. Okay. Thanks a lot, Sarah, for that. <laughs> Okay, um, sorry, that was, wasn't the one I meant to click on. Um, Kathleen Hale would have to check my sourcing specifically, but it was in one of the roundups about where former FBI profilers said Brian might be. But I actually, seem to remember someone saying that quite recently as well. Um, yeah. Someone said that quite recently as well. And I think it's true. I mean, it definitely is. I think why he took his own life was because he thought without her, I'm nothing kind of thing. Um, so anyway, I'm about to wrap up here. Trouble brewed when after initially getting engaged, Gabby saw reality. I also like the way um, uh, Kathleen writes here, reality hit hard. I think that's exactly what happened to Brian and Gabby, but especially um, to Brian. I think reality hit really hard on this trip, that this is the reality of loving someone. This is the reality of work. This is the reality of life. Um, but something else that Kathleen uh, mentioned that I was glad to see was that Gabby actually owned the van and Gabby also owned the center and, and kind of makes you think, what did Brian own? You know, um, where was Brian? Who was, who was, um, where was Brian's financing came for, coming from? And I think we know what the answer is to that, but I'm just saying, so Gabby's got this vehicle, the Sentra, which I think she sells 
and puts a lot into the the Ford, but the Ford's in her name as well. So she's got all of these assets and she's the worker. And Brian is just like this bee buzzing around the honey pot, right? And without the honey, what is he kind of thing? Um, anyway, so trouble brewed when after initially getting engaged, Gabby saw reality. We're too young. That's also something highlighted by Kathleen in the article. I'm not quite sure whether that is what her parents said that she said, but it's nevertheless kind of, um, I mean, it's self-evident and it's certainly self-evident in how this story ended, but it clearly was the case that um, Gabby was too young to realize who Brian was. And I think Brian was using that to his hope and hoping to use that to his advantage. Like, can I marry you ASAP before you realize what I am, who I am, or even more important, who you are and what you're capable of, and that we're not a match kind of thing. So um, I think she was likely pressured from a family member um, also, you know, into saying, uh, okay, we're not ready to get married. But the engagement for Brian was like winning an unlikely jackpot, only to have more and more of it scooped away until he felt like he had nothing left. And I think if you think about Brian is like, yes, I've won the jackpot. And then when he goes on this van life thing, it's like with this idea of, well, I'm going to, you know, enjoy the jackpot. Only that the reality of it is that it's less and less pleasant. And so, in other words, it's this expectation, this entitlement, this idea of um, it's going to be this free ride and this, this holiday. And um, because he has got this fantasy in his mind, it turns out to be this horrible experience. It's hard. It's difficult. It's disappointing. Um, Gabby's not doing as he says. Gabby's irritating him by investing in this silly little website. And um, it's because Brian doesn't have any concept about value and his own value in terms of Gabby is warped. His own sense of worth is warped. It's not real. And he's probably come from um, these, you know, books like Lullaby as well. I must I'd be very interested to hear what um, Kathleen thinks about those books. I mean, it's another author. Um, are you going to be reading those books? Have you read those books? Um, you know, I'd be interested to see what you think about that. Samantha Dang, thanks a lot for that. Tommy says, I feel like I've been to the Met to listen to a new book reading. <laughs> okay. Well, that kind of is what it is. Okay, and so um, uh, Brian, I think, thought he was winning an unlikely jackpot, only to have more and more of it scooped away until he felt like he had nothing left. And I think when he felt like he had nothing left, that brings us to the Spread Creek camp. And, um, and now he feels shortchanged, and now he feels angry, and now he feels, um, what's the word? Um, uh, well, the, the, the feelings that manifest when you're angry, which is, you know, clenching your fists, gritting your teeth. And remember that thing that, that came up earlier, that he could lose his temper very, very quickly. What are the exact words? He was the kind of guy who would get pissed off pretty quick. So you can imagine if Brian's feeling short changed more and more and more. And Gabby says something like, Gabby's in the tent. And Brian says something. And Gabby says, um, I don't know, she just chirps something to him. You know, um, well, at, you know, like she says, well, at least I've got this or something like that. It's Or it's my van, you know, it's my van and you'll do as I say, you know, um, and then he suddenly realizes, well, I've got nothing. And he gets angry. It's like, I've given you so much and you've meant so much and this is how you treat me, right? And so Brian's now going to feel shortchanged by Gabby, by life and by the world. And so it all comes crashing down. So I'm kind of pretty much at the end of my spiel, but I do want to um, quote this from the article, this is actually going to the article itself. Um, where is it? That, that I thought is such a great um, comment 
or um, statement from Kathleen um, highlighting an aspect that is so obvious and yet overlooked, I think, by a lot of people. She writes here, visitors to Bridget Teton were not supposed to camp outside designated areas, but Gabby and Brian's location um, boasted a scenic view of the surrounding mountains. What I mean by that, what Kath Kathleen means by that is the, the um, campsite that they chose was not a designated campsite, but they were like, well, um, we're going to do things our way. Right. And so, but they were breaking the rules. And there's, there's something about that not knowing boundaries. I think Gabby herself was perhaps not sensitive enough to the boundaries she needed to respect um, in terms of public boundaries, but also um, being aware that Brian was was crossing lines and that she need to she needed to set up boundaries with him as well. But I think that's just such an ironic thing. They weren't actually supposed to camp where they were. They, they camped outside of a designated area, but they did it because they thought it was going to be awesome and probably it was going to be Instagrammable, right? And of course, by doing that, they suddenly placed themselves in a place where there was no one around to hear them fighting. And that's the unfortunate aftermath to both of them um, crossing that particular line kind of thing. Um, Pauline um, says, I think Rose joining them would have crushed Brian. He couldn't have her join them. I wonder what um, Kathleen thinks about that, about Rose joining do you know about um, Rose was, I think, going to turn 21 and she'd already arranged time off work, um, you know, and so that was definitely on the cards. And you kind of get the feeling that Rose and Brian didn't get along and, or, or that Brian didn't like Rose kind of thing. And Rose and Gabby got along and Rose sort of tolerated Brian um, sort of for Gabby's benefit kind of thing. Um, Julie says Brian was overly financed by his parents for too long. Uh, Stephanie says, I hope we receive a few new nuggets in the Lifetime movie, like the photo and draft letter from, yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think when you pay a lot of attention to a narrative, then you start asking questions, and there's certain little areas that you follow up on, and often you do find things, and you obviously go to places and speak to people, and then it's a kind of a question of, we're doing this, can you give us something, and and maybe something will happen. Maybe something will be revealed, right? Uh, Jane Whirl, Jane Whirl too says, good topic. I think the Rose visit actually put a deadline. Yeah, I think that is true. I, I do think that is true. Okay, so um, it would actually be good to have Kathleen read some of her own article, especially, um, I think the Moab incident part would be amazing, but also the very end. Um, but that, in a way, might be a spoiler for everyone who wants to read the article. Uh, but maybe she can come on at some point um, to do that. So it would be unfair to Kathleen and to the article to serve up any more. Make sure you read it yourself. It also deals, as I say, with the Moab incident in a systematic and insightful way. I'm going to be continuing to unpack the Moab incident from tomorrow onwards. So tomorrow's, uh, it's actually tomorrow is today where I am right now. It's four o'clock in the morning on July 2nd. Um, but as you can see, I'm wide awake. Uh, thanks for that, Kathleen. Um, but so I'm going to be, I'll be doing, I think it's episode eight or nine. I think it's episode eight 
of the Moab incident. And every time we do it, every time I do it, I definitely learn something else in terms of the dynamic because you forced to slow it all down and to pay attention to all these little details. And so we're going to continue with the Moab incident. And I also want to try and go through the timeline in order, but in terms of the social media. Um, so we'll see about that. Um, what's also interesting, and I think Kathleen's highlighted this, is there's quite a lot of writing from Gabby herself in those Instagram posts where she um, discloses with, with his self-disclosure about certain things taking place. And, and um, Kathleen's just provided a great example where she um, spoke about, I think, the shoes she was wearing and, and got a good response from that. And that's from her own sort of disclosure. So um, Kathleen also provides a scenario for what Brian did to Gabby and how he did it that, to me, reads authentically. I just want to see how, how you guys have voted so far. Um, do you agree with the Vanity Fair? Did I say Vanity Affair? Uh, sorry about that. Do, do you agree with the Vanity Fair scenario of the incident at Spread Creek Camp? 63% say yes. And I've got to add my voice to that. Um, so about two thirds of you say it does resonate. Um, so that brings up this final footnote. Uh, where is it? That's no, not there. So this is from the Vanity Fair article. It's the final footnote that's referring, obviously, to this final thing. And it's basically Kathleen saying, well, this is where I got this information from, and this is what I based my hypothesis on, right? And so that's what I'm going to read here. So the final footnote is footnote 25, and it is worth um, highlighting and pausing to read on it. Kathleen Hale suggests that evidence shows that Gabby was likely killed inside the tent. That's been my position as well, right? So this is what she writes. According to news reports, Gabby's body was found on the decline slope of a creek bed. But, and this is the point to highlight, there were no signs of a struggle on the ground itself indicating that Gabby was likely not murdered at the site where her body was found. So there's no disturbance in the mud. There was no, you know, none of that picked up kind of thing. And um, suggesting that Gabby might have been killed inside the tent, then carried out and placed on the creek bed. Um, what I think is also quite insightful here, as she writes, the tent was then packed up and carried away, taking any signs of struggle with it. I would love to know what happened to the tent. Was the tent found in the van? Was the tent found at the laundry home? Where is the tent now? Now, and what was, what was ultimately, um, what evidence was ultimately resurrected from it? The other part, which I mentioned when I did the analysis of the eight-page um, letter, eight-page confession, was noting that Gabby's. Uh, Gabby was found without shoes on and her, her boots, her hiking boots were some ways away from her, but actually left there. Um, her shoes were found near her body, indicating she may have been in the tent at the time of her death. And I thought, again, this is quite a good insight from Kathleen. Campers do often take their shoes off and leave them outside the tent door. You can kind of just visualize they are, um, they've, they've now gone to all the trouble to camp where they are, and it's a little bit treacherous, it's quite cold, and it's difficult walking to and fro, but they're quite isolated where they are. Um, and um, Gabby gets into the tent for whatever reason, maybe she's cold, maybe she's um, composing social media, maybe she's about to um, post photos of the Grand Tetons onto Instagram. And maybe while she's busy with that, she's hearing from Rose or something or whatever it is, but she's inside the tent and Brian is perhaps doing something outside. Perhaps he's cooking dinner. Perhaps he's um, strumming his guitar. And once again, Gabby's not with him and he's, he isn't like that. And he's calling her and saying, come join me, come sit with me. And she's saying, I've got to finish this first. And he doesn't like that, right? So 
that's how far I've taken it. And uh, yeah, so that is that's my spiel. Yeah, so HI says, what's not there in the tent? Where is the tent? Yeah. Um, the other thing that I think I read this in your article, Kathleen, is I think you said she was covered in a blanket. Um, I'm not sure where I've read that before. Um, to, to be completely fair, I'd always assumed that she was sort of semi buried and se semi covered in some thing. Um, and I, I've often wondered, did that black top that is on the top of the van in the, in some of the pictures right at the beginning. Did that go home with them? Sorry, did that go home with Brian? And was that ever found? Or was that something that was associated with the campsite? Because often when you camp, you, you do use a top um, as, as your sort of floor. So I wonder, um, I wonder about that, that's for sure. I do remember going to a lot of effort trying to find out because they said she was buried in her favorite shirt. Poor Gabby was wearing her favorite sweater and then going through social media to try and figure out what was her favorite sweater. I remember that. Uh, Kathleen says, interesting but unlikely because he also throttled her, uh, banged her head on the ground over and over. Yeah, that's the scenario that you gave which is very kind of straightforward and plausible, I must say. Pauline says uh, that would go along with Brian's note that he says he should have built a fire sooner. They were cold. Yeah. Good point from Julie says Brian Enton said cell reception was no problem there. So if you're saying you're speculating, you, you don't know that Gabby was on her phone. Well, there was no reason she wouldn't have been based on the cell reception. That I think is a really interesting aspect as well. Okay, so um, it's a pleasure, Kathleen, and I, I feel both nervous and nervously excited that you're here, and we'd, we'd really love to have you um, in a show. So I think you should maybe uh, contact me either on Instagram or on on, uh, on Twitter, and you can maybe set up a thing. Um, I don't know if you want to expand on what we've we've dealt with here, but we could easily do a, just a part two to this. Um, and it would be amazing to have you read. Um, it would be amazing to have you read the snippets that you choose, and then expand on some some of your thinking behind those snippets. And also other writing that you may have that you may want to share. So that would be awesome. Um, uh, Karen Sanderson says, was there flip-flop outside the van door? Yeah, well, there were two, but I think those were Brian's. So it would also be interesting to hear what you think, uh, Kathleen, about the van door opening. Sorry, the van door closing. Um, do you think there's intrigue there or, or um, any thoughts on that? Um, Mel Stiller says, please, Nick, let us know when Kathleen joins you. Thank you. Well, I definitely will. So I thought this is quite interesting from, um, from going, following up on some of the links in the Vanity Fair article. Um, I'd obviously been to Gabby's Pinterest page, but um, there were some parts of it that I hadn't sort of seen before. And so it was interesting seeing um, seeing some of these things that you'd highlighted. There you can see Gabby saved two words, right? Um, every little thing is going to be all right. It just does sketch in a way Gabby's psychology. 
But, you know, all of these aphorisms in a way are empty when you haven't tested them in the real world. And in a, in a way, they separate you from the real world. There's another one. She's also capable of having a sense of humor. I wonder if that's a reference to Brian. I think the, the big thing that they had in common was um, the, the mutual interest in art. And I think that's another area where um, Brian was a kind of pretender. I thought Brian's art was quite terrible and quite cartoonish and quite amateuristic. And it's another thing that Kathleen highlighted very well, I thought, where she said, Brian's art is like copycat, whereas Gabby's was creative. Um, Gabby's art had um, something to it, right? Whereas Brian's was um, kind of vacuous, right? Kathleen says, I'll reach out on Twitter. Thank you. I'd be happy to do whatever. Uh, your idea sounds great. That, that'll be awesome. Thanks very much. Um, so that is it, guys. Um, how long have we been on? An, almost an hour and a half. It's really been a surprising show for a couple of reasons, but um, definitely enjoyable uh, and, uh, and definitely interesting. Um, Ricardo says his comic drawing sounded strange. Yeah, um, I think Kathleen also mentioned in her article that that um, uh, to quote from Brian on his Instagram, I think where he said something along the lines of that he, but it was so ostentatious and so full of himself and so arrogant. Remember, Brian's only twenty three years old, and he's basically saying. He said something along the lines of, um, you know, if I become a famous artist one day or, or I owe my artistic prowess to the guy who created Hellboy. And it's like, Brian, uh, you've still got a lot to learn. Your art's still not that great kind of thing. So Donna McLeod says, I'll have to go back and watch this from the beginning. Indeed, you will. Um, per, per bag says, um, thanks everyone. Yeah. So thanks very much everyone for joining us, Kathleen as well. It's been a, a treat having you on. Uh, everyone's going to read your article and I think everyone's already getting very sort of excited and uh, 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 the sense of anticipation of um, a book on this case. As far as I know, there isn't a book on the Gabby Petito case. And um, certainly not a good proper book. Um, as far as I know, there, there just isn't one. Otherwise, I would have heard of it. So it's definitely something that needs to be out there. This narrative in Vanity Fair is definitely a really good start. So um, I know how hard it is writing a book. So I just want to wish you well in your in your um, journey. Um, and I think a lot of people, um, certainly based on this article, um, are unfortunately for you expecting a lot because um, it's really written well. And all you've got to do is do your thing the way you've done in this article and it will probably be a really good success. So um, I've got to say, when I read it, I was so, um, impressed that I just spontaneously was like, and impulsively was like, I need to share this because it was so good. So I hope that's a um, encouragement to you and a compliment to you. It's definitely a compliment you deserve. Okay, um, cool. So that is it from me. Um, it's a shorter live than usual, but that's what I wanted to say I've said. So there we go. Stephanie says the article was moving. Yeah, so the, the strongest part, the best part, 
the um, most powerful part and also the hardest part to read in a way was was the end. Um, and um, I think it's appropriate not sort of to read it here, certainly not at this point. If um, Kathleen wants to, that'll be up to you. Okay, guys. Um, Julie says his art was self-consciously strange. Not authentically strange, yeah. Certainly was bizarre. Okay, Yvonne, Yvonne says thanks for making Nick's night. And uh, thanks a lot for joining us, guys. And uh, I'll see you guys again probably sun, well, yeah, Sunday, um, 1 p.m. Eastern time for the deep debrief of crime con dealing with Casey Anthony. So look out for that. There'll be Stephanie and Lisa, my uh, previous co-author. Thanks everyone. Take care and I'll see you guys next time. Ciao.